Hello, this video is to complement Chapter 9 and My Sociology on the topic of research methods. Why should anyone study sociology? One reason to study sociology is because it is an accurate way to understand society and human behavior. The key word here is accuracy. There are many ways of knowing about society everyday experiences and common sense, authorities, revelation, tradition, religion, and then research. Well, research is the type of way of knowing that sociologists rely upon when trying to understand society. In fact, sociologists rely upon empirical data. Empirical means that it can be measured. And they use the scientific method to explain society. In their effort to explain society accurately, sociologists seek to be objective. That is, they want to eliminate bias. Whatever the opinion of the researcher, the researcher does not want to force his or her opinion on the research study. So researchers seek high precision and low bias. If a study is conducted according to the scientific method, then it can be replicated. Accurate studies, when repeated, will yield the same results. With regard to precision of measurements, we should discuss the concepts of validity and reliability. Very simply, validity means that you measure what you intend to measure. Reliability means that the method of doing the measurement is so precise that if you were to replicate it, you would get the same result. Let's look at validity for a moment. Validity refers to the appropriateness of the measures. If the measuring device actually measures what it is set out to measure, then it is valid. For example, suppose you conducted a survey and you wanted to understand the attitudes of students at your school about smoking. If all the questions on the survey were about smoking behaviors, such as how many cigarettes per day do you smoke, and those questions did not yield data about the respondent's attitudes, then your survey would not be valid. That is, it would not be a valid measure of student attitudes about smoking. Even if the data was 100% accurate in describing behaviors, still it would not be valid because the point of the study was to discover information about attitudes, not behaviors. You cannot conclude that a respondent is in favor of smoking just because he or she smokes a lot. Think of all the smokers you may know who have, who cough hard and exclaim, I hate this stuff, I have to quit, while lighting another cigarette. Another, one way to ensure validity is by asking the right questions, selecting the right variables to measure, defining the variables in a meaningful way, and constructing useful hypotheses. In the case of a survey or interview, this involves constructing questionnaires that properly address the research question. And the questions must be interpreted the same way by all of the respondents. Reliability refers to the consistency of the measuring device. In other words, if the study was conducted properly, for example, if a random sample was used instead of a convenient sample, then when you replicate the study using the same methods for the same population, you should get the same results. If you do, the study is reliable. If the study was conducted properly, it will yield the same results each time, and therefore it would be reliable. You can rely on it to be accurate. In your textbook, the steps of the research process are described. Some textbooks describe this in terms of 10 steps, others 7 steps, others 8 steps. The exact number of steps is not really important. The important thing is that you understand basically the process that one goes through to conduct a research project. The first step is simply to formulate the problem or decide what it is that you want to study. And it has to be a topic that can be studied empirically, something you can measure. You can't measure, for example, is there a God? with empirical measurements. But you could measure how many people in your society believe in a God. 
The next step would be to review the literature. And by literature, we're not referring to classic works of literature like Moby Dick or Great Expectations, but we mean all the scientific research that has been done on that particular topic up to this point. And mostly that scientific research is found in journal articles that are refereed or reviewed by other experts in the field before they're published. Then you would develop your hypothesis. In elementary school, you probably learned that a hypothesis is an educated guess. You should stop right now and clap for your teacher if you still remember that because your teacher did a good job explaining it to you. However, I'd like to give you a college level definition for hypothesis. A hypothesis is a prediction about the relationship between two or more variables. We'll talk more about that later. Then you would choose a research design. Examples of research designs could be a survey, or you could use observation, or you could use existing data that someone else has already collected. And those are just a few examples of research designs that you might use. You'll choose the research design that most appropriately fits the research problem that you're trying to study. Then you'll collect the data using your research design. Once you've collected the data, you'll analyze the results. And this usually involves putting the information into a computer and studying it uh, at some length. Finally, you'll interpret the findings, draw conclusions in relation to your hypothesis, and, and disseminate the results or share that results with others. When we were talking about hypothesis, I suggested that it was a prediction about the relationship between two or more variables. So to understand that definition, first you have to understand what is a variable. A variable is a concept that can have different values. For example, the variable sex could have two different values, male or female. The variable grade could have many different values, such as a number from 0 to 100. In that case, you'd be able to distinguish a 79 from a 78 or an 80. Or grade could be defined in terms of A, B, C, D, or F. In that case, you wouldn't be able to make the discrete distinction between two single grades, but you would know which grades are higher and which grades are lower. The process of defining a variable in a way that you can measure it is called operationalizing the variable. In a research study, you usually have a dependent variable that you're trying to understand. And then you identify independent variables that you're trying for which you're trying to understand how those their independent variables affect the dependent variable. A change in the dependent variable depends on changes that happen in the independent variables. But independent variables are independent. They don't depend on change in other variables. For example, in the case of attendance and grades, grades would be your dependent variable, and attendance would be your independent variable. Your hypothesis might be the higher, the, the, the more often a student attends class, the higher grades they'll make. So that's a prediction about the relationship between the variable attendance and the variable grade. So a change in the, deep, in the independent variable uh, leads to a change in the dependent variable. You also learned in this chapter about sampling. Sampling happens when you want to conduct a study of a population but you can't afford to study everyone in the population. The population is the group of people that you want to know something about. The sample are people taken from that population that you actually study. And you hope that your sample will be so much like your population 
that whatever answers or information you gather from the sample will match what would have been the same information if you studied everyone in the population. In your textbook, you see a table that describes strong unbiased sampling methods and poor biased sampling methods. A convenient sample where you just get whoever you can to answer your survey or your questionnaire or participate in your study is not a very strong method because you can't generalize the findings that you get from your sample to the larger population with a convenient sample. The convenient sample only ever represents those individuals who actually were selected for the sample and no one else. In contrast to that, a simple random sample or a stratified random sample would allow you to generalize to the population with some accuracy. In fact, if your sample is large enough, around 1,500 people, you can generalize to a hypothetically large population with 95% accuracy. What is a random sample? A random sample is one where every member of the, sample, of the population has an equal mathematical chance of being selected for the sample. The simplest way to do that will be to take the names of all the members of the population and put them on a slip of paper and a big hat. Stir the hat up and then draw out your sample. Every name in the hat has an equal chance of being drawn out. And that will be what we would call a simple random sample. So random sampling is always better than convenient sampling because you can generalize it to the larger population. There are also a few simple, very simple statistics that were explained in your text. Mean, median, and mode are what we call measures of central tendency. The mean is what you've always probably called the average as you were growing up in school. So it's just where you take all of the cases in a study and add them up and divide by the number of cases. The median is the middle number. If you were to line up all the people in the study from greatest to least and count halfway through, that would be the median. So if you had 101 respondents and you lined up their answers from greatest to least and you counted half of them off, you'd wind up at number 51 because 50 of the cases would be less than number 51, and 50 of the cases would be greater than number 51. That's the median. The mode is the most frequently observed value in the measurements that you've taken. A correlation is a statistic that sociologists use to determine how strongly two variables are associated with each other. Do the variables move, sort of move together? Two variables are positively correlated when variable A, if when variable A increases, variable B also increases, or when variable A decreases, variable C also decreases. So if every time you attend class, your grades go up, that in that case, the variable attendance and the variable grades would be correlated. They move together. They change together. The number, the statistical number, the statistic that describes how strong the correlation is between variables is called a correlation coefficient. It's a decimal number between negative 1 and positive 1. The closer that number is to 0, the less those two variables are correlated. The closer the number is to 1 or to negative 1, the more strongly the relationship between the variables. It's also very important to understand that just because two variables are correlated, that does not mean that one variable caused the other. It just may happen that they move at the same time in the same direction for other reasons. When research, when sociologists and other scientists do research, especially when they work under the umbrella of a college or university, 
they first proposed their research and sent it to an institutional review board called IRB for short. The role of the IRB is to oversee research projects in order to protect human subjects from potential harm. So they would do, re review what the researchers plan to do and make sure that any people that are involved in it wouldn't be harmed by participating in the study. All right, so we've been talking about sociological research. And we the main point here is that one reason to study sociology is because it's an accurate way to understand society and human behavior. But a lot goes into making sure that it's accurate. And that's what we mean when we talk about research methods. Sociologists employ multiple scientific methods to gather and interpret empirical data about society and social issues.